Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Forensic-Led Policing in Denver webinar. All phone lines are currently in mute mode. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll address it at the end of the webinar. I'm now going to pass it to Julie McGregor, who's going to kick it off. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Julie McGregor with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, National Training and Technical Assistance Center. And on behalf of BJA, I just want to welcome all of you to the Forensic-Led Policing um, in Denver. Uh, webinar, and uh, thank you for joining us. Today, we're excited to have folks from the Denver Crime Lab with here today uh, to share with us the work that they are doing. And uh, we want to share this information with you for those that are already running a crime, a crime lab. But we are also looking for, if you're also looking for new ideas, um, or for those of you who are thinking of starting a crime lab, this information should be helpful to all of you. Special thanks to Greg uh, LeBerge, um who is the Director of the Forensics and Evidence Division with the Denver Police Department. And I want to go ahead and uh, pass the baton over to Greg to get us started. So welcome, everybody, and Greg, passing it to you. Thanks. Uh, we appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, I, I saw the uh, registrant list, a lot of people from crime labs and also law enforcement agencies. We want to share with you today um, really a response to a lot of the pressures that many of you feel and kind of how we've approached some of these, some of these pressures of, of, of forensic science, trying to deliver forensic science in a big city environment and trying to make it where it makes a difference and, and that that difference is actually carried through all the way to, uh, all the way through investigations. So I have with me here today uh, some of our senior staff that run the different units in the lab. I have Susan Burdine from the DNA unit Amy Williams from Leighton Prince, uh, Zach Kotis and Chuck Reno, both from our firearms unit. What we want to do is talk to you a little bit about data flow, about kind of work models that we've created here over the years, and then how each of these areas uh, play a role in almost real-time policing, what we like to call forensic-led policing. Uh, all of them rely on database technologies, as all of you uh, have, I'm sure, and how we are leveraging those databases uh, to have the most impact on the streets of Denver. So one of the things that you've probably seen before, this goes back probably to the early 2000s, probably about 2003 to 2006, there were major studies conducted in the United Kingdom. Um, a person by the name of Bob Green, Bob Green is a professor at Kent University now in the UK, Back in the early 2000s, he ran the um, uh, special, I think it was the uh, professional standards unit of the home office in the UK. We went over to the UK in 2006 myself. My, my supervisor at the time was a chief, uh, dip, or a division chief in Denver, Dave Fisher, and Mitch Morris, the, our district attorney, to really have a look at what the UK was doing around forensic-led policing. So we went over there in 2006 and were fortunate enough to be hosted by the, the government in the UK and we went around the country to see best practices as we were on the eve of really changing things in Denver in 2005 and 2006 around forensic science. Um, since then, we've done a lot of work programmatically. We've looked at our business processes in DNA and latent prints. We've published a lot of that through NIJ studies and we have papers that are gonna be coming out in forensic journals when we, have the, when we can get the time to to sit down and write them, we have a lot of data. But one of the things I want to focus on that we learned in the UK that I think is a really important lesson for forensic scientists, but also for police executives in general, and that is if you're spending millions of dollars, and in Denver's case, we just built a laboratory in 2012 and opened it, it was about $36 million at the end of the project. We had almost $40 million to build it. And our budget each year is roughly $10 million with staff and with all the supplies and consumables. And our, and our laboratory includes a crime scene unit that handles uh, property crimes as well as major crimes. They do about 5,300 scenes a year. Just to give you some perspective, one of the things that we mentioned to the chiefs early on was, if you're gonna spend this much money on forensic science infrastructure, what really are we getting out of it? Is it, what, is it really worth this investment? And should we make the investment to build the new lab and keep expanding the laboratory? And if we do, there has to be a mandate or there has to be a willingness to follow up on all of the forensic intelligence or the leads that we derive for the police agency as a whole, right? 
So our structure here in Denver is I report to the Deputy Chief of Operations directly, and so I'm equivalent to commander level. Um, so I do not report to a commander of major crimes. That's a separate division. I run the Forensics and Evidence Division, just so you understand the structure. So we're very vertical here in Denver. We have one public defender's office, one district attorney's office, one investigative branch to the police department, really, which is, falls also under my, my direct boss, which is the Dep Deputy Chief of Operations. So we understand that many of you may not have that vertical structure, but I think the lessons are still are relevant. If you're going to spend a lot of a dollars on forensic science infrastructure, what is going to be coming out of that, out of those leads? So one of the things that we achieved uh, several years ago was, and it's very important that success isn't always measured as the number of hits on a database, although that is a contributing component. If you have no hits on a database, then how can you have any downstream investigations of that? But we wanted to define success on the database as what kind of follow-up and what did that lead to in terms of an outcome on any given case. So what we did with the police command, and this came out of our DNA cold case project that we started in 1999, really unofficially, we got some funding in 2003, and Susan Burdine will speak just after me about that project. That project was very instructive because we started to get a lot of hits on the database. Uh, initially, we got probably about 45 of them that were from very serious sexual, um, sexual murders because we front-loaded our most serious cases. But we did not have any investigative capabilities built in downstream of those matches to actually go out and investigate them. So we found ourselves a little bit flat-footed in terms of we generated more leads initially than we thought we would, and this was going back to about 1999. So we had to really play catch-up, and what we did is we created a cold case unit basically overnight. But the other thing we did that's very important is that we created a uh, policy, and, and that's section 301.33 in the Denver Police Operations Manual, which states what I have on the slide here, is that there's mandatory follow-up that officers have to do something when they're notified of a match. And so I'm going to go through a little of this. Um, in blue, you see the written summary that has to go to the investigating detective's uh, chain of command, which includes their sergeant, um, lieutenant, uh, bureau commander, or district commander, as well as the deputy chief of operations within 24 hours. So that 24 hours means that they have to figure out whether that individual who's identified by CODIS or APHIS is connected to the case in a way that's meaningful, in other words, that is probative. Um, and they have to do it within 24 hours. And the problem that we were having initially was detectives, it was one case, one detective. So. If the detective whose case you got a hit on happened to be on vacation, there's really no way for that case to be investigated by someone else because there was this um, individual's um, ownership of the case. So we had to kind of break some walls down with that. And we did that through this policy, which basically says if the detective is off, and this, this is just part of the policy, I think that if you want to look up the entire policy, I didn't want to bore you with a huge amount of text here you can go on to online and look up Denver Police Operations Manual, and it's under Section 301.33. It, it lays out the entire policy. This is just part of it, kind of the most relevant part. They have to go through and they have to figure out what was the um, role of whomever we matched on the database in the case. And often that could be consensual partner. It may be a friend of a victim who was visiting an apartment and touched something that we ended up lifting prints from. But however the outcome, it's important that the officers within 24 hours figure that out and put it in writing up the chain of command. Um, I'm going to give you an example of that uh, in, in a second. The other thing we do every week is we have a comp stat meeting or a core meeting. We call it core, C-O-R-E. And that, that's command operations review and evaluation. It's modeled off of New York City's comp stat. And as a, as a command level person, I'm at those meetings every week, and I provide a report from the entire laboratory every week that goes to the command staff. And that report, this is the first page of that report, and unfortunately you can't really see the detail, but I'll tell you what it is. In the far left column, it tells what kind of match we have, either latent prints, niven, or CODIS, 
it gives the date that we got the, uh, the match, the go number, which is the general offense number, is how we track cases here throughout our, our, our records management system, the type of case, and then importantly, the precinct, as well as all of the other information of addresses, who it hit to, uh, more information, and then the very far right side is, is follow-up. So we go in and research as a crime lab each one of our hits, and we figure out, well, has anybody followed up on that match? And if so, what was the follow-up? And we can do that through our records management system. And we include that in the report. So the report is typically 20 pages, 15, 20 pages, and every reporting period, which covers about a 60-day span, we actually will generate anywhere from about 150 to over 300 matches, depending on, um, depending on our workflow. Um, the important thing about this report is that everybody's notified every week of the last 60 days matches that have occurred on APHIS, CODIS, and NIBIN. So it's all in one place, it goes all the way through the chain of command, and there's accountability to the productivity of the laboratory. So not only as a laboratory do we show our productivity, we actually then put it in a summarized format. Here are all the things we've been productive on. So, for example, we've had, we'll have meetings where they may have a precinct, like at the top here, I think it's 111, where they have a burglary problem. And when they're talking in the CompStat meeting about what are we going to do to try to solve the burglary problem, when you're sitting there and you have three or four burglaries that have matches on CODIS, now all of a sudden you have three or four names which they can focus on, obviously. Um, our fastest turnaround right now is Leighton Prince, and we're going to talk about that with Amy Williams. But it shows you now, right down to the street level, where the matches are occurring, who they're hitting to, and it gives forensic identification of people right down to the, to the uh, precinct level of the city. So here's an example of one of those follow-ups. Uh, this is a Niven case on a business robbery that happened. Um, we sent out the Niven hit report, and everybody on each Niven hit gets notified the investigating detective, the sergeant over that area, the lieutenant, myself, the deputy chief. And then the sergeant follows up within one hour with the following. He lays out all the details of the case, um, talks about the match where it occurred, and gives a status report as to where the case is going to go from here. So that's within one hour of the notification. That's accountability to the forensics. And so when you hear us talking about forensic-led policing, we're using the forensic intelligence, we're getting it out to the street as quick as we can, and then the street sergeant is coming back, or the special unit sergeant, in this case, uh, it would have been the robbery unit, is coming back within an hour of that notification with important information as to what their role is gonna be. So the, the other thing we do, and this is just starting, so this is kind of new, these are, we have six policing districts in Denver. This is data for just four of them. We're actually looking at, well, what are the outcomes and how do they break down by district? And the reason we're doing this is there are some detectives that work in districts. For example, um, most of the property crimes in Denver are handled by detectives that are decentralized and work in a district. Uh, major crimes such as uh, sexual assault, murder, kidnapping are handled by a unit that is down here at headquarters, and that's a separate unit from the district. But by far, about 50 to 60% of our work is property crimes. So what we do is we actually go in and we look at the outcomes of these cases, and then we revisit it a year later to see how many of those outcomes are converted to cases that have been filed to the DA. So you'll see in these, bar, in these pie charts the, the results for four of our policing districts over the last year in terms of uh, case outcomes. It's important to look at this because you can see they're pretty similar. If you had a really weak district, you could probably identify that if the detectives were not uh, aggressive to follow up, they may fall behind significantly. But if you look at the suspect arrested and charged in blue, it's pretty close to be anywhere between 21 and 31%. Over time, you can start to ask questions, well, are there differences between the districts? So for example, um, refused by DA, you see the next one down, there's a much larger refused by DA in District 1 than there is in District 2, and well, why is that? And we can maybe get into some of those reasons to see, can we improve the, the case acceptance rate in District 1 versus District 2? I don't know the answer to that in this 
case, but it gives you information as to the performance of the follow-up of the forensic intelligence that the crime lab pushes forward. And we think that's actually a very important aspect of what we do. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Susan Burdine from the DNA unit. She's going to talk about the cold case project in DNA as part of this, and then we'll have some time at the very end of the webinar for any questions. So I appreciate your attention and, and being on the webinar. Uh, this is Susan Burdine, the DNA technical leader of the DNA unit. Um, some background on our cold case project. Uh, the very first cold cases that we tested for STR DNA technology were three unsolved sexual homicides that were all tested in 1999, placed into the CODIS database, hit to each other, identifying a common source, and then had an offender hit to Ned Pace in April of 2001. Um, those were later successfully prosecuted. And the CODIS hit was a tremendous investigative lead. Investigators had been thinking it might be a truck driver committing these crimes due to the location of the body dumps. And it turned out Ned Pace was a Denver native, went to a local high school, and, and never had been part of the investigation. That really opened the eyes of our crime laboratory and our department to maximize using DNA and the CODIS database because what other power, what other investigative tool was available that could be leveraged to reopen violent crimes, in particular homicides and sex assaults, and provide valuable investigative leads? DNA can, of course, also be used for reconstruction testing to try to determine what happened at a crime scene, but we consider it a, a far more valuable use to take a case that's unsolved and cold with no leads and be able to provide a suspect name on that. And the, the difference that makes in an investigation can be tremendous. A little bit of timeline on our program. Uh, we were already preparing to launch a cold case program in 2002. We did, had some pilot data on how much the detective case review would cost, as well as we compared the cost of in-house DNA analysis to outsourcing and found in-house testing would be more effective. In 2003, we received our first NIJ grant award that funded both detective case review and DNA analysis. We launched the project in February of 2004. We tested our very first case in August of 2004, an unsolved sexual homicide that resulted in two CODIS hits, one to Florida and one to Washington State. And again, this amazing ability to link cases from Washington to Denver to Florida, um, where otherwise investigators would almost never be in communication. This had an impact on other units in the city. Um, it impacted our victim assistance unit, where they developed a special protocol on notifying cold case victims and their families, as well as Due to the volume of code assists we were generating, we created a dedicated cold case detective unit that also had uh, six detectives and a surgeon. Um, additionally, our Denver District Attorney's Office added a cold case unit with specialized prosecutors handling those cases. So with NIJ funding, our project began um, in force in 2004. And we intentionally wanted to start the project with a lot of success. So we went for samples that we called our low-hanging fruit. We actually had some stored DNA samples in our freezer that had already been extracted with prior legacy methods. We pulled those samples out, tested them for STRs, and loaded them into CODIS, and generated 41 CODIS matches in the first six months of the project. This had a, a major impact on our uh, investigation decisions, where, or our investigative division, where they needed to build the team and the infrastructure to handle those CODIS hits. Um, one thing they determined is that cases where the offender is not in custody get the top priority. Um, we also have a, a really efficient and streamlined workflow within our state, where 85% of our CODIS hits approximately occur within the state. The remaining 15% occur at the national level. Um, our state works with us to release offender information immediately if the offender is not in custody on some of our, our violent crimes. Um, our process for sending CODIS hit notifications is to 
email them so they're really sent as quickly as possible. As soon as we can get that quality confirmation and review done, the CODA tips are sent. Um, not just to the lead investigator, but also to the supervisors in the chain of command so that if a detective has been reassigned, the CODA tip doesn't sit. Um, and the fugitive unit is used for some immediate arrests um, to locate and apprehend suspects. Really, the foundation of our cold case project is having resources, buy-in, dedicated staff, and collaboration between all three of these disciplines. Um, if we have that just in the crime laboratory with forensic scientists, we might do testing and generate a hit, but that hit doesn't have meaning if it's not investigated by a detective and then presented for prosecution because our goal in investing in forensic testing is to see cases all the way through uh, successful investigation and prosecution. Um, finally, some statistics on our case uh, or on our cold case program. It is one of the largest and most successful cold case programs in the world. Um, we've reopened over a thousand cases with potential DNA evidence. We've had over 428 CODIS hits. Um, we have about a 45 to 50 percent CODIS hit rate on our database, um, where when we submit a profile, almost half the time it's going to result in a hit. We've had over 118 cases filed. Uh, another major development out of this program is John and Jane Doe case filings. This actually relates more to property crimes where there's a three-year statute of limitations. Um, a John Doe filing files a case on an individual by our DA's office based on their DNA profile instead of their name, and it tolls the statute of limitations so that if, if a CODIS hit is obtained one day or a year or, or any length of time after the statute has expired, the case has been preserved for filing, and it can then be converted to the named defendant. So we've had 282 John or Jane Doe filings, 91 of which have later been converted to a name identified. Um, really, the key takeaways uh, from our cold case program are, is that NIJ funding for us has been spanning over a decade and has supported this program tremendously, um, and that CODIS follow-up is key, that the results being produced from this DNA testing are meaningful, and we have the infrastructure in place with our investigations that they're treated as meaningful and get immediate attention. Um, the other piece in, in terms of real-time forensics is on rush cases, we're delivering DNA results in 24 to 48 hours and set up for CODIS remote searches and for those results to be forwarded to detectives immediately. I'm going to turn it over to our latent print supervisor, Amy Williams. I'm going to be talking about our Colorado automated fingerprint identification system and more specifically about how we have streamlined our workflow in our unit to get those results to our detectives as quickly as we can. First off, our APHIS system underwent a pretty quick and um, lengthy process of advancement here in 2013. We actually advanced about 20 years in technology from the advent of our original system in 1993. So if you think about how much technology had changed in 20 years, we were light years uh, forward of what we originally had to start with. So that system brought some major changes to Colorado and actually how we even use the system. We now had the ability to enter lower quality latent prints. We also were able to search our latent palm prints, which was not previously an option for us. And most importantly, we decreased the response time for our actual APHIS hits from one day to just a few minutes with our new system. It also added direct access to our state database. Examiners now have that ability to print out and use records exactly taken from our state system, which has resulted in a tremendous time savings. We no longer have to wait for a response from either the Colorado state system or any local agencies when we need a 10 print card or a palm print card. Now the majority of our latent print evidence here in Denver comes from our latent print uh, lift envelopes which are turned in by our crime scene unit. 
These folks are able to submit their latent evidence directly into a lockbox in the laboratory, which then the latent print unit retrieves on a daily basis. This then allows us to generate a lab case number, as well as initiates and starts up the chain of custody on that particular evidence. We then take these lifts and deposit those in a st locked storage cabinet we refer to as a CARDEX system, where our examiners can retrieve their cases directly from this cabinet. The examiners then will enter what they deem to be the most suitable latent prints, and sometimes will actually reserve their exams to the evidence that was located in the most probative areas, specifically the interior of a vehicle versus the exterior. The examiner also determines how many candidates, when they enter a print into AFIS, will return when they send their search off. Within a few minutes, the examiner will then be able to go through and evaluate the candidate list and will then complete a manual comparison of any identifications they believe they may have in their case. For any manual comparisons that need to be completed, the examiner, like I mentioned previously, can then print out the fingerprint or palm print cards directly from that same terminal. So this process has proved to be both very efficient and very effective. We have been able to give verbal notification to detectives per our policies and procedures within sometimes as quick as an hour. The detectives, just like Greg and Susan both mentioned, are typically required to follow up within 24 hours. And oftentimes, we have had detectives actually, with the assistance of the fugitive unit, like Susan mentioned, arrest our suspects very quickly and most often the same day. This is an example of a graph of our examinations and our latents in our system from 2012 all the way up through 2015. If you look at the increase in the caseload, we have a 52% increase in only two years from, or I'm sorry, from three years, from 2013, 12, excuse me, up to 2015. The number of latent prints that we've examined during this time frame has increased from 203%. The same time frame, we have a 101% increase in APHIS-generated identifications. This does not include any identifications that may occur after that initial APHIS identification has happened. So this has been quite a challenge for our unit specifically, uh, mainly because our staff of four people has not actually increased in over 20 years. Uh, we also only have one APHIS terminal that all four of us use, which has forced us to change our overall plan for the latent print workflow in our system. Uh, we actually did conduct an NIJ research uh, efficiency study back in 2013. That actually helped us eliminate quite a bit of bottleneck workflow areas. Um, we streamlined our process as far as our documentation, our analysis. We really worked hard to work smarter with what we have. So we have been regularly working at overcoming these challenges. Like I mentioned, that efficiency study that we completed, we will do limited comparisons in cases, like I mentioned, focusing on the interior of the vehicle versus the exterior, again, more probative areas. We typically prioritize our crimes against persons. We are also, thankfully, hopefully, to to hire a latent print examiner by the end of 2016, which will expand our staff up to five. The other units in the laboratory have been very generous in, in giving us the ability to cross-train some of their employees to do latent print chemical processing for our unit. So we have resourced all of our units together. Specifically, Forensic Biology has donated one individual to us for one to three days a week for about the last year, year and a half at this point. That gal has done hundreds and hundreds of cases for us at this time. Specifically, that employee has been focused on the overlapping cases between forensic biology and latent prints, which has allowed the process itself of testing that one case to be handled by, or I should say, the process of testing that one item of evidence or that one case for two different units to be taken care of by one individual. That has helped tremendously for both units in expediting those particular overlapping cases. Uh, we also continue to request budget funds for the purchase of additional APHIS terminals. So I, I see there's a question specifically regarding four people assigned to APHIS or to all types of latent print casework. That is unfortunately four people assigned to all latent print casework. So we don't have any one person working specifically in one area of our unit. Yes. We complete all casework equally across the board. So all examiners are trained to the same level. Okay, so 
We do verify all of our APHIS hits. So that is something that is a very critical to our field, as is most other forensic disciplines. So no notifications will take place prior to a verification by one or more examiners. Uh, that is something that we actually have written into our standard policies and procedures, and verbal notification actually will not take place without approval from the technical lead of the unit, which is myself at this time. I'm going to pass this off to Zach Kodis, who is a, a firearms examiner in our firearms unit. Thank you. So today I'm going to cover how we do our NIBIN analysis. So what we do in our firearms section, we like to refer to as uh, real-time NIBIN. We really take a proactive approach to the entire NIBIN system. And what that means is what's unique about our system compared to other agencies out there is our NIBIN process is completely separate from normal casework. So everything I'm going to cover today doesn't include our normal laboratory re requests and comparisons. So we do that for a number of reasons. The main reason is NIBIN hits our investigative leads, and we all experience a backlog in the forensic community, and so we don't want to have investigative leads going out when we get around to working a case, which could be weeks, months, or years later. So we want to push NIBIN to the forefront, and so therefore we deal with it completely separate from normal casework. We really strive for about a 48-hour turnaround time, and by that I mean from the time that the evidence comes into our property section to when we finish the NIBIN correlation. And we realize through this whole process that it's important to be fast for investigative information, but it's also extremely important to be accurate. So because of that, um, our laboratory only puts out NIBIN confirmed hits. And by that we mean that two examiners, qualified firearms examiners, will look at each um, case side by side on a microscope before we actually issue that hit confirmation. And we realize that you know other agencies out there are doing NIBIN investigative leads right now, and we understand that, and there is a time and place for that. Um, I would just urge places that are doing that to have some sort of qualification before they put these investigative leads out, That because if you start putting investigative leads out that don't end up panning out, um, it could get a bad reputation, and then what cause what that could cause is detectives not really following up on some of these investigative leads. So what we have found through this process is a couple things that we've had to overcome is um, potential DNA on firearms. When we first started this program, we were holding off on shooting any firearms until it was sought for DNA. But we, what we've done now is that our firearms examiners and our NIBIN techs are now trained by our DNA section to swab the cellular material off of all the textured surfaces of the firearms prior to us test firing them. Because again, this proactive search is every morning we are searching our property bureau for any cartridge cases and semi-automatic pistols that go into our property. Um, and we are retrieving them that morning from property, evaluating them and entering them into NIBIN all ideally before lunchtime. So again, we are the first ones to handle these firearms, so that's why we are going to swab them before test firing them. Um, also, latent prints on firearms. We have decided that with talking to the latent print section that we are going to wear gloves on all evidence, including all the firearms, and we are conscious of the smooth metallic surfaces of these firearms and magazines to not disturb any potential prints on them. And then another thing that we've run into is a need for a lab request. Some labs out there have to have a lab request or issue a report um, before they handle any evidence. And what we've done here is um, really just decided how we wanted to do our NIBIN program, write our SOP accordingly, and then we are in compliance with all of our SOPs. And that applies to our ISO accreditation as well. Um, our correlation reviews is also could be a slowing aspect. When we first started this program, we were looking at 100% of the correlations coming back. And at the time, they, weren't, they were in a couple hundred. But now as the database is growing, we're looking at on a nine millimeter up to 600 plus results. So that began slowing us down. So we started looking at where we were getting these hits in the correlation list. And from this graph here, what you can see is um, we looked at 190 hits 
before the Trax 3.0 upgrade on the Nibina system, and then 190 hits after the Trax 3.0. And as you can see in the red here, um, we had a couple hits pre the database upgrade that, you know, one went almost to 300 in the list, a couple went um, just over 200, and we had regularly over 100. So that's why we were looking at all of them. But now you can see in the purple color, since this upgrade, it's drastically reduced. In fact, we've only seen one approaching 80. The vast majority of them are in the top 20. So what we feel very comfortable with now is that we only look at the top 100 in our correlation list. And we feel very confident that with looking at the top 100, we're catching all of our hits now. So that's sped us up greatly. So uh, Scott, Scott asked a question there about firearms examiners wearing gloves. We've actually taken it quite a bit further, Scott. Uh, firearms examiners don't do test fires. So we have a robotic system that does that. So they set the robot up and they test fire the firearm within a robot. So we do no longer hand fire firearms in the crime lab. And before we were using that show cart, when we, when we were examining the firearms, we were using gloves before that too. And it took some getting used to, but we have found that all of our trained examiners, that it's very easy and safe for us to be wearing gloves while operating these firearms. And um, it's just something that we've become accustomed to, and it's just good practice all around, because we don't know where those guns have been before we're touching them, plus we want to preserve any possible evidence that are on there. So I just wanted to put up this up here. We are ISO accredited under 17025. Um, we've been that way in the firearms unit since 2008. So this real-time NIBIN approach does work with ISO accreditation. And again, the accreditation really is say what you do, do what you say. And again, like I said, if you write your SOPs accordingly on how you want to do your casework and your NIBIN work, you will be in full compliance with this. You just need to have the flexibility to rewrite these. And part of this is writing these entry reports and hit notifications to have documentation of what we're actually doing. So we wanted to keep that simple to keep the process moving quickly. So I'll give you a quick example of what these look like. This is an example of our entry report. And as you can see, it's a series of check boxes. Um, it's essentially saying that this gun was test fired and or swabbed and, test and entered into NIBIN. And then the lower portion is the cartridge cases. <clears throat> it's a pretty simple report, very easy, quick to fill out. Um, but that way we have it documented um, what we did with that firearm and the cartridge cases. But as you can see, the red verbiage on the top and the bottom, um, the, on the top it says that this report is investigative only, and on the bottom it says that by test firing this weapon, we are not saying that it's mechanical functioning or anything else like that, because again, to reiterate, this is completely separate from our laboratory work. So if they need a mechanical function check on the gun or the um, further analysis on the cartridge cases, they would need to submit a laboratory request. This is an example of our hit notification. Um, again, it's a simplified report, just outlining the details of one case, hitting to the details of another case. And again, you'll see at the top a red verbiage saying that this is not a laboratory report, this is presumptive in nature, so this really gives the investigative lead, and if they want further analysis for us to look at all the evidence in the case, you need to submit a lab request. And at the bottom, you'll see there a series of signatures that shows, A, the person who's authored this, B, the person who has done an admin review of the hit report verifying all the numbers are correct and the names are correct, and then above that, um, the two examiners who have confirmed microscopically this hit. This is an example of how we keep everything straight and um, everyone on the same page. This is called our HIT matrix, and it's something that we've developed when we started this um, Crime Gun Intelligence Center because we have people from our department, from the ATF, um, the DA's office, and the police chiefs, and outside agencies as well, all looking at these hits. So we've developed this in Excel, and at the beginning of the year, the first hit of the year becomes 16-1, and then the second one 16-2, and yada, yada, yada. So, and so each one of these hits, you've got multi, each one of these hits pertains to one firearm. And see so what you'll see on some of these hits, they have supplements underneath there. So let's say on the 16-14 there, it's got a number of supplements underneath. 
So we first initially had a hit with two cases, and then later on we find cartridge cases that match those again. We keep them under the 16-14. So when we push these hits out, they are very easy to track. Everyone knows what hit string they apply to, and everyone's on the same page. What we have found um, when we first started this program is we were thought potentially this could lead to a drastic increase in our laboratory requests. But what we found is um, you can see from 2009 to throughout 2016 now, the NIBIN entries has drastically increased and our NIBIN hits are gradually increasing, but the firearms lab requests are actually staying pretty constant. So we haven't seen any sort of impact in getting swamped with laboratory requests from this process. And what we found with dealing with outside agencies and getting this part program started is it's really important to that everyone must buy in. And what I mean by that is, especially if you're an agency that um, processes evidence for outside agencies, it starts with the officers out there collecting the evidence and submitting them into property. That needs to be done in a timely manner. They need to c collect and submit into property every cartridge case, not just on ones from Hope Pry profiles. Then the laboratory, as I outlined exactly how we do things, um, we will do the real-time NIBIN, as we, we've discussed. And on the back end of things, once we get a hit, we need the submitting agency and the ATF or any of the assigned detectives to really follow up on these NIBIN hits. Because if we're putting this information out, we really need follow up on this um, for this to be successful and to get the arrests um, on these cases. So this just gives you an idea of the manpower that we have here. Um, this started again in January 2013. We refer to it as the Crime Gun Intelligence Center. So we have the people in our laboratory. We have a number of ATF contract positions housed in our laboratory. And then we also have ATF agents um, that are working on the investigative side of things. We also have a CJIC coordinator, which is that ATF contractor that really processes a lot of these hits, and I'll discuss what they do in the next slide. But this just gives you an idea of who we have working here. Um, the five firearms and tool mark examiners I have listed there, that's from three different agencies. So here in Denver, we have two qualified firearms examiners and one in training. And then we have um, Aurora, Jefferson County, and we've got outside agencies that are bringing us their evidence as well. So this Nyman hit referral, the CJIC coordinator is, again, that ATF contract position. And so when we confirm a hit and we're getting ready to email it out to the assigned detectives, he will actually read all the information on the hit cases and digest them and determine any commonalities between witness statements, um, cars. And he is housed here in the lab, right in our section. So we are in direct communication with him. So as we're putting out this hit report, he's issuing a referral to the detectives and the ATF agents to immediately follow up on these hits. We have implemented ShotSpotter here in Denver. In 2015, we got three square miles. They rapidly increased that. In 2016, we've got six square miles, and we've just increased that even more. Um, and this just shows you some of the stats. That, those stats you see there are for the year of 2015. But on the NIBIN side of things, what this has really done for us, and if you're not familiar with ShotSpotter, it's, um, it's a company and a technology that listens for the audible sounds of gunfire, and it triangulates the exact location, and it pushes that information out to the officers in the area so they can get extremely fast response time. So what we've got here in this graph, what we've done is we've got firearms, cartridge cases, and hits. What I did was I averaged the 2012, 2013, and 2014, and compared those numbers to 2015 when ShotSpotter took place. And what we found is pretty overwhelming. We've got 66% increase in firearms, we've got 159% increase in cartridge cases, and 174% increase in hits. So as you can see, ShotSpotter has really um, taken off here. It's aided us in jumping to the next level and really given us a lot of numbers here to expand upon. And as you can see, in 2016, we are projected to be even more on this year. So it's continuing to rise. 
So with that, um, I'll open this up to questions. Um, again, thank you all for joining us here. We appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat> this is Greg LaBerge. Um, um, one of the things I want to point out, I think I'm going to go back one slide to kind of make a point. Um, there's a lot of places have shot spotter, but what we wanted to do here in Denver with shot spotter was make sure that the downstream uh, customers of shot spotter, which would be the shell casings and the guns, had a place to go. So obviously we had a, a very, we've had a very proactive NIBIN unit since the 1990s. And so we had our workflow already worked out rather well. So when shot spotter was put in place, it was put in place on the back of an already pretty efficient workflow. We didn't just inundate our firearms unit with shell casings and guns without having a, a well-designed workflow already. So ShotSpotter complemented that, and, and what we're seeing is if you have to have all of the links in the chain from the crime scene all the way to the courtroom for you to, for you to derive this kind of success. Um, ShotSpotter is a great example of how you can use technology to interdict active shooters. So the Crime Gun Intelligence Center's focus is to try to get after active shooters as fast as possible, and to date we've um, we found well over 64 or 65 of them that have been involved in over 170 shootings using a combination of street intelligence, good officers on the street, uh, coupled with shot spotter detection and NIBIN hits. Uh, one of the things I want to point out too is that if you talk about, uh, when you're talking about personnel within the crime lab, Typically, crime laboratory personnel work on scientific things. We've made some changes around that where we're more like an intelligence agency where some of our personnel now will take all of these matches. And when, when Zach was talking about um, the NIBIN coordinator, and I'll back up one slide, CJIC coordinator, that person works in this lab but puts together all of the demographic information, vehicles, suspect names, and things like that that we pull from our, our records management system on the NIBIN hit strings, and he's already got a, a spreadsheet created with all that information that gets pushed to the street detectives and intelligence agents to go out and start working the street on those cases. The important thing there is that that's coming out of the laboratory, not just that there's a match between several ca uh, sh shell casings, but he's now putting out a packet of intelligence to the street that gets them working faster than they normally would because otherwise they'd have to put all that together. So I think that's really an important, um, uh, important aspect of what we're doing. I'm going to try to answer a few questions here. One says, does your lab use a limb system? We've had the B system since 1998, so we're very mature on a limb system and we've been using it for almost 20 years. Uh, do you, uh, what do you do with latent print cards that are deemed to be of no value? So we still initiate a report on those. It would just be considered to be a no value report is essentially what it is. So those are still examined, those are still reported out. It's just obviously treated different than an APHIS hit. And go ahead and answer the next question. What APHIS system do you use? We use the Morphil Track APHIS system uh, that is run through the Colorado Bureau of Investigation here in the state. And then Susan, how do you accomplish a 24 to 48 hour turnaround? Well, that's for our highest priority DNA cases, and that's easier to do when it's um, a few samples, although we can do it with a larger sample size. So really, we um, have 19 staff in our DNA unit. We have coverage from before 6 in the morning until after 6 at night. So we have um, people start the evidence examination, go through almost the entire DNA testing process in one working day, which can be up to a 12-hour day or people staying late as needed, do some instrument runtime overnight, and then um, interpret and review the data the next day. Are there any other questions at this time? We're watching the screen to see if you type them in there. Hey, Greg, there was one, Chris, this is Poppy. There's one question that came into the chat. Um, it was a rather long question. It was, has DPD examined whether variation in quality of police community relations between districts might account for differences in arrest and filing? Uh, for example, level of victim and witness cooperation might not be the same in every district. Could this affect follow-up independent of detective prosecutor commitment to the case? 
So Denver Police Department is very committed to the community, obviously. We're a modern police department. We have a very strong community relations unit and the district commanders are very integrated into the community. Uh, I don't have any data per se that would, would, that would support whether that leads to um, more or less follow-up. I think what I'm talking about here is following up on, directly on the forensic intelligence. Um, the street investigations teams uh, will take advantage of those community connections, obviously, that uh, when it comes to getting into, onto the street and trying to find out who the active shooters are, for example, it's true there are some neighborhoods that are, that's difficult to do. But I'm going to give you an example that might be instructive. So if you have several shootings in a neighborhood and say um, people shoot into a stop sign just to shoot their guns off, and then you might have a murder a week later down the street of two people get murdered, the chances of someone talking about that murder are probably pretty low. But it may be that if you get out to the shooting in the stop sign within 24 to 48 hours and ask people in the neighborhood about someone who shot at a stop sign or shot at a dumpster or shot at an inanimate object, it's more likely that you might get somebody to talk about that because they're not thinking that any crime was committed. But if that shell casings, those shell casings from those types of cases shots into things tied to the murder that happens later in the week, then you have a, an investigative lead. So it's important, uh, important to have that community involvement because that can break free information on lower level cases and, and that includes fingerprints for property crimes also, where you might get investigative leads from that community connection. We're looking at the next question here. It says, what is the compliance with the 24-hour follow-up? The compliance, uh, we're actually testing that statistically, but we've had detectives, we've had one detective who failed to, to do that and disciplinary action was taken against that detective. So we are paying attention through the chain of command uh, to the 24-hour follow-up expectation, and there has been administrative work done because of that if it hasn't been followed up on. Um, question for Zach, it says, you advise you don't develop investigative leads. Do you mean then that your unit only works to validate established suspects? Well, we're working with physical evidence, so what we're doing is we're, we're pushing out leads that are the connection between physical evidence. And um, well, well I think that also what you're talking about is that I mentioned that we're not doing um, NIBIN leads. And so what I meant by that is we're putting out confirmed hits, meaning that um, two examiners are looking at the evidence, whereas there's a term out there right now, NIBIN investigative leads, that um, people are putting out there. So we are absolutely developing investigative leads for, that's exactly what we're producing is investigative leads for our detectives. It's just that terminology that other people are using as opposed to a confirmed hit. Um, so, and then um, on a previous question I saw about how many homicides do we have in 2015? Greg may know the exact numbers. I think it was in um, the 50s. And the number of firearms we see come in um, from Denver, approximately about 900 total from the outside agencies up to about 1,100, 1,200 firearms we'll see come in um, in one particular year. Okay, I see a question regarding turnaround time from the prints coming into the lab to generating an AFIS report, and is the efficiency study from 2013 available? The efficiency study should be available online. It was an NIJ report. Um, the turnaround time from prints coming into the lab to generating an AFIS report and actually even giving them a verbal notification has occurred in less than an hour. I would say on those rush cases or immediate threat to public safety cases, Typically, we're looking at a couple hours, but I would say it averages anywhere from one to four hours on those rush status cases. Susan, there's one there for DNA. Uh, our lab does test DNA from crime scenes without standards for comparison. What do they mean by a standard, though? Known sample, probably. Yeah. Well, um, we do suspect, no suspect cases all the time. That's a big part of our case work. Oh, yes, so testing without a sample from a known suspect, yes, routinely. Um, does any 
anybody else on the line have questions? Um, if so, please type them into the Q&A at this time. Um, okay, you want to just, there's two more. It says, is it easy to get a tour of your facility? Um, well, we do do tours, uh, but we do them uh, based on requests coming in. We usually do them toward the end of the week. Uh, as an ISO facility, we can't let people into the operational labs. You can see through one window, but when we built the new laboratory, that was very expensive to try to put windows in all the laboratories. But we have ways around that. So if you're interested, you can call the main number and ask for someone to uh, connect you with a, with a potential tour. Um, all firearms processed in a standardized way, yes. They are all processed in a standardized way through the firearms lab. Um, we have people cross-trained, as we mentioned, for uh, evaluation for DNA and prints. So they are all processed every morning in a standardized way. So there's a question regarding the casework backlog with only four people in the latent print unit. Um, we actually have had quite a, a few FMLAs in the last year, uh, which has, has pushed our backlog uh, back just a little bit, um, but we're not doing bad at all. We are staying on top of our crimes against persons, and, and we're, we're maintaining. We're doing okay. Uh, external agencies, do we process evidence for? So right now, we are Denver is a city and a county. Um, we only help other agencies if there's really a connection to a Denver case in general. The one exception to that is our NIBIN program, where um, we've designed our program to assist Aurora, which sits directly east of Denver on the Colfax Avenue corridor, Lakewood, which sits directly west of Denver, and Jefferson County, which sits just south of Denver and southwest of Denver, and we're looking at expanding that uh, to the northern uh, counties that have a lot of shootings because the, there's a big connection between shootings around the metro area, and we're trying to get it where we can have the same level of service around the metro area, especially along our busiest corridor, Colfax Avenue. So that's what drove that. That and the number of uh, gun, gun crime-related statistics or gun crime-related cases drove how we were uh, able to partner with external agencies. So far, that's been a very productive thing to do uh, in terms of real-time NIBIN. Uh, we don't do it for fingerprints or for DNA yet. Uh, NIBIN is actually the best model for that currently. We're, we're not really set up for the others yet because we don't do crime scene investigations for them. But right now, uh, NIBIN seems to be working as a, as a great model along that metro corridor. Great, thanks. There was one other question that came in. It says, how much buy-in from street officers for these tools? It's a great question. Um, it's really important to have feedback all the way to the street. So one of the things we do as a laboratory is, uh, first off, when we get new recruit classes, we have three days of training at the academy. So the crime laboratory personnel train them from crime scenes all the way through the disciplines uh, that they will be using as officers. So we train them for three full days, which also includes a practical exam as to how they evaluate a crime scene for forensic evidence. So we typically do 60 to 80 recruits at a time, and we usually have two to three recruit classes going every year, so it's a lot of teaching. That's one thing. The second is um, we, we play very, we're very close to the, 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 the uh, commanders of the district. So when officers play a role in collecting forensic evidence, like they identify DNA, they call the crime scene unit out for prints, they collect shell casings, things like that, when these knife and hit reports come out, that gets fed all the way back to the street officer saying that the shell casing you collected had a role in solving, say, an ag assault or it played a role in a homicide investigation. Uh, same with DNA and fingerprints. We try to involve the patrol officers as much as we can so that the feedback loop is there to give them buy-in to continue to look for forensic evidence. So it's something that we have that's cultural here. We've had a crime lab in Denver since 1930s. So we're pretty deep in terms of uh, penetration of forensics into the agency, and the agency is very forensically aware. Not to mean, it doesn't mean that we're perfect in any way. We, we still have our areas where um, we, we still need more personnel. We still have our challenges. 
But what's really good is that the officers are aware of the role of forensic science being central to criminal investigations. And the other benefit to that is we're getting to specific individuals faster, preventing larger, um, we'll call it dragnet type uh, approaches to criminal investigations. So what you'll see happen in Denver, if a major case occurs, the first thing the chiefs, the mayor, others are asking are, do we have any DNA? Are there any knife and hits from shell casings? Do we have any prints? So they're thinking forensically. And that actually took a lot of work over several, uh, several years, I'd say the last 20 years, really to get that level of understanding and that level of expectation to where it is today. And we think by building the new lab and, and being as present as it is here in Denver, it keeps building on that forensic-led policing model, which we think is the right way forward in terms of policing the United States. So we appreciate everybody's attention. Great, Anything thanks, Chris. Um, sure. I thank everybody for joining today, um, and thank uh, the, all the presenters at Denver to, for uh, joining us and talking about the crime lab. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email to attendees um, with a link to this presentation. Um, so with that, uh, thank you well, all for joining us. Any questions or you need any support, uh, one of the things we're committed to is we're committed to justice and committed to the communities that we serve here. One of the things that people ask me who our customer is, and, and the customer here is the citizens of the city and county of Denver. And that, that's something we take real serious. We love this city. We're here to try to improve the city and make it a great place to live. There's a lot of people moving here. I'm sure there's a lot of questions about other things like legalization of marijuana. That's a whole other presentation. But we're proud of this city. We're proud of our role. And we hope we've been inspiring to some degree for others. So one thing I want you to know is we're there to support the community. And if there's anything we can do, please let us know and we'll help as best we can. Great. Thank you. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.